Welcome to another episode of Inside the Recording Studio. I am Jody Whitesides, and with me as always is Mr. Chris Hellstrom. How are you today, Chris? I'm doing great, Jody. I, what was the intro there? I don't. That was energetic, and then it just sort of died off at the end. It's a guy jumping off of a cliff on his skis until he goes down to the abyss. <laughs> well, hopefully that wasn't you this morning. But <laughs> no, no I'm good, me. man. I, I'm ready to do a little podcast chatting here. So how's everything on your end? Aside from just tweaking my other elbow, hoping that it's not going to swell up to a grapefruit here in the next week, I'm okay. You're hopeless, man. What, what's with all the injuries? <laughs> this is... <laughs> I have no idea. It's just absolutely bizarre. Crazy, crazy. What's today's topic? What's the subject today? Production candy. Yes. We mentioned production candy when we talked about using tracks as production inspiration. We thought we'd drill down a little bit more what you and I consider production candy. Sure. Because I think this can probably mean different things for different people. First off, what does it mean to you? Production candy? Yeah, that's kind of what we're talking about here. So let's go with that. <laughs> the type of stuff that you don't notice on first listen most often. Little things that are tucked into the mix somewhere where you're listening on your not normal listening environment. And you suddenly notice something and like, oh, I never noticed that was in there before. That to me is production candy for the most part, especially when it's like Easter egg kind of production candy. Others are way more like smash you in the face with an anvil type of thing. And those to me <laughs> don't yeah. really feel like candy. They feel more like this is my production style. I'm going to smash you in the face with it. What about yeah, you? I, I, I think I'd go along with that, but I, I think my definition is a little bit broader. Mm. I think of those things that are, like you said, that you don't necessarily notice them right off the bat at first listen. Anything that is sort of unexpected audio that sort of captures your interest as well. So like if you're listening to a track, and, and I'm not talking necessarily like arrangement-wise, like, oh, the guitar dropped out. Woohoo! Right? But <laughs> um, That could be considered production candy, though. Yeah, it could be. But, but I'm not thinking of those as that. I think that's just an arrangement thing. Yep. Other things that could be in there, it could be like a production style, how you're treating a certain piece of audio just to help it sort of set it apart. It could be anything that's just unexpected audio that is in there. Sometimes subtle, sometimes not so subtle, uh -huh. but something that piques your interest. Like, ooh, that was unusual. That's kind of cool. Yes, I agree. Yeah. Right. Now that we've so, done that, podcast over. <laughs> yeah, that was it. That was easy, right? All right, cool. Thanks for listening, everybody. But why? why would you use this? Why are we doing these things? I do them for adding some interest. I think it could be a subtle thing that adds a little depth to the track, or it's something that simply captures your interest and sort of propels the song forward. Mm -hmm. Add some interest to where it might need it. You know, it's not part of the instrumentation or something that just kind of makes it less blah, if you will. Like if there's, <laughs> less if there's a lull, yeah, <laughs> if there's a lull in the track, right? placing these little nuggets in there can greatly enhance that. It, and it could make a low energy part feel more energetic because there's something that happens. You know what suddenly struck me? What's that? As you're making this description of what it is. I got this image of the movie Amadeus in my head with the scene where he's talking with Salieri mm -hmm. and the king apparently had yawned in one of Mozart's performances. Right. Which means yeah. it's immediately canceled. <laughs> yes. And he's trying to get these ideas of, well, how do I do this so that the king doesn't yawn? And Salieri is giving him this advice, and it's just so backwards when you think about it. <laughs> well, it's all about pleasing the audience, yeah. But that's a great movie, though. It I, is. I enjoyed that, yeah. But um, the concept of it is actually a particular piece of production candy of, like, how do I end a song? <laughs> That's essentially what the discussion was. Yeah. Give them a big bang at the end. <laughs> yeah. And, and I mean, some of these production candy things can be standard fare for certain types of music. Sure. I, I think if you're doing more 
electronic music or EDM or anything, a lot of it is built off of sound design and sort of par for the course. If you're doing more traditional style, I think it can be harder. Let's say that if you're doing a jazz trio, oof, how, how do you add something in there that doesn't sound completely out of place, right? The first time I noticed something like this that I thought was really, really cool mm -hmm. was a Kiss song off Destroyer. Oh, boy. And I think it's a song, Great Expectations, but there is build of the chorus toward the end, and there's actually glockenspiel that adds to something. <laughs> now, that is obviously a, a Bob Ezrin thing, sure. right, who, who produced that album. But it was one of those things that you don't think of, or at least at that point, right, you don't think of like a, a rock band at that point, like Kiss, right? Oh, it's glockenspiel, let's add that. <laughs> but when you hear that, it's such a subtle thing, and it's like, wow, that is really freaking cool. Yeah. So that sort of piqued myself, ooh, that's nice. I wonder where else can you do that? And I think that was just a trigger for me when I started noticing these things in other tracks. Well, I wouldn't say that I noticed this, but I will go with the same album within a different song uh -huh. in that Detroit Rock City, the song itself, right, opens up with sort of like this day in the life of the character. Yes. <laughs> with the radio yeah. playing and the car and everything else going on before the song kicks in. Right. That's production candy in a sense, because it doesn't right. necessarily fit into the concept of the rock song other than you're getting this slice of life going in there. And I'm sure that you could go back even further in time and find other examples of bands that have done that as well. But speaking of interesting instrumentation that fits into something, Green Day mm -hmm. with When September Ends, there is mm -hmm. an enormous amount of production candy in there if you tear that song apart. Well, that's a very, very well produced and arranged and mixed album. But of that's course. True. Right. So, so. It's fantastic. A any points in particular that stand out to you in that or from that track? There's a couple of different little like piano like parts. And then I believe, I don't know if it's harp or something, but it's a very airy, plicky, plucky little melody thing going on in there that you have to really tear the song down in different configurations of listening through EQs and stuff to find those things because they're mm. tucked in there extremely well. Right. Things like yeah. that. And right. the why on that to me is just, as you mentioned, do you keep the listener's interest up? And the more stuff that you put into a song in that regard, the different environments that you listen in will pull different pieces of those elements out so that somebody's always hearing something new in that song production, in that song, and hopefully tie them even closer the more intimate they can get with it. Yeah, I, I, I agree because sometimes you, you know, whatever your normal listening experience or environment is where you consume music, as it were, you might have other things pop out if you're listening on a really good set of headphones or even like in your car where your speakers just have a different frequency response and the mid-range might pop out differently. So you start noticing things like, oh, I sure. didn't notice that that was a layered thing or whatever it is. It is interesting. I mean, these things are not necessarily new in, in a modern sense. I mean, if you go back to things like Sgt. Pepper mm -hmm. by the Beatles and stuff, it's like yes. thanks to George Martin for everything that he contributed to that, right? So yes. it goes back. Now that we've established kind of what our thoughts on production candy is, how did you go about sort of implementing it in thinking about what it could be? Are you doing that from already from the writing standpoint or are you doing that as an after the song is tracked and or mostly tracked in any way and you're starting more to put on your really intricate production hat, kind of mixer hat type of thing? Well, you should know the answer to this. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm going to guess it's content dependent. No, yeah. it's not. It, well, it depends on the end result and where it's going. I think about that. And the crazy thing is, I think it was a guy named Mark Luna that really clued me into that. It's like, always think about your end result first. 
And that so came from a songwriter stance. But do you mean, what do you mean by that, though? When you say think of the end result, are you thinking about this is how I want the song to have the overall appeal or an arc? Or what do you mean when you say that? The format that it's designed to go to. In other words, I'm not going to hide a crap ton of production candy elements into something that is background music for a television show. Oh, okay. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Knowing where the writing and the production elements are headed for their final result. From an artistic standpoint, go nuts. Mm -hmm. That's simple reality. Don't be like Elon Musk carrying in a kitchen sink to Twitter, but go nuts kind of thing. If you know where it's headed, like a film or a TV situation, chances are you are less likely to get the license if it's a real mess of production candy in there, mainly because you're going to be detracting from what the actors are saying and things going on on the screen. That type of music doesn't call for that kind of stuff. So if I'm producing it, I don't tend to think about it for that. If I'm writing it, again, I don't tend to think about it for that. If it's an artistic thing, I will tend to give artists suggestions of what to place in there to keep a listener's interest because they don't think about it most of the time. Yeah, I think it can help to have an outsider's view, if you will, Mm -hmm. if you're not the writer. Because when we are writing, naturally things are a little bit more precious to us. And we have sort of like an intention in the back of our mind when when we're writing. But as an outsider, you might notice those lulls or when the song might be losing a little bit of interest in a different way than the than the writer has. I'm with you there with to go back on the, the situation where with pop music and the writing, you want everything as interesting as possible. Right. And mm-hmm. I think interest can sometimes be silence and gaps, right? But, but that that's not the point. But you if know, you're the writing same can be for, said for video game music too. Yeah. But when you're writing for TV is Certainly, if you're doing like underscore or anything like that, you, mm-hmm. you have to be aware, obviously, that it shouldn't sound like that proverbial Vegas casino because <laughs> you're, you're going to be trampling Unless over dialogue. But let's say that we're dealing with pop music. And what about if it's your own stuff that you're writing? Do you consider those things from the get-go or does, do those reveal themselves a little bit more down the line of the writing process? A little bit of both. I'm going to say a little bit of both. Sometimes I think about it up front. Sometimes I think about it as it's being tracked. Sometimes after the fact. Okay. So is that the things that happen after the fact, if you will, later down the line, do you find that that happens more when you have a little bit more of a distance to the track if you're not knee deep in it, as it were, when you sort of recorded everything? in? in, Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sometimes you need to take a moment, step back, relax. Come back with a fresher set of ears. That's how I would explain that. I also would say that it took me a while to get into the concept of production candy, although it wouldn't seem like that from my first solo record, I guess would be a good way Mm. of saying it. But I don't know where I started coming across the concept of adding production candy, but one of my first reviews that I ever had was like, almost pure nonsense by the person doing the review is like, what the fuck was that? Flying cars? <laughs> <laughs> and despite flying cars, we're going to take a word from our sponsors. And we're back at this point. Now we are going to actually talk about actual production candy concepts. Kick it off, Chris. Well, besides the uh, audience member driving to the show and then, subsequently getting killed in the story, as in the case of Detroit Rock City, right? (laughs) But um, it could be just relatively simple things like drastic pans of certain elements. Now, when you say drastic pans, what do you Mm. mean by that? Because there's two schools of concept there. And I know mixing guys that will do center, left, and right. That's it. Those are the only three places they put things. And then there's other guys, such as myself, who will put things 
anywhere in the spectrum just because it's going to give it some room from everything else. And I don't care hard left, hard right, center. Right. But then again, of I'm, course, I have to worry more about balance when I'm breaking things down for mono. But hard right, hard left, center. Is that what you're talking about in terms of drastic pans or is it something else? Something else. That's okay. not what I'm talking about. But what I'm talking about is placing something in the stereo spectrum where you might not expect it. Okay. So let's say a lead vocal, mm -hmm. generally straight down the center, right? One in the middle. But it could be on a certain phrase, perhaps, where it's going hard left or hard right. Well, that, that may or may not work, but that's the kind of thing I'm talking about where there might be a guitar fill that is going the same idea. It's just popping out of extreme left or right where it's otherwise might be considered being something that's a little bit more tucked in. So those, what I mean by drastic pants, something that is out of place, if you okay. were. I would so. throw a slight twist on the drastic pan concept. I say this because I am doing a remix of an old song of mine called Tabloid Affair, and I'm using the same panning concept that happens in the bridge in the remix. It's this loop and to create interest on the loop, which was straight down the center, I panned it hard left and hard right in a very rhythmic fashion. And when okay. you listen to it, it's panning those automations so fast that you're hearing the elements of the loop popping out on left and right sides. And to me, that would be drastic panning because it's uber fast in how it's working, yeah, it, but it does not give you a seasick feeling as it's being done because it is rhythmic and it is flowing with the rhythm of the loop that is there. That to me is a drastic pan. Okay, yeah, I would go along with that where it's drastic movement in the stereo field as well. I think sure. that, that's sort of like a drastic pan, something that just sets it apart, right? Uh -huh. With talking about drastic pans or things, another one that is really good to do sometimes is if we have a vocal throw where a vocal throw like what i'm thinking of that is an echo or a delay on a vocal uh -huh. that is happening just it's not a static delay that's going on on the lead it's just like throwing out one time either left or right or something right so something again that adds a little bit interest to the line it's like oh it echoed over to the left side Brilliant work by Chris Halstrom. <laughs> <That was, laughs> so, don't break your arm. <laughs> right. Uh, no, but those things I think can be really interesting too. And I think that's something you mentioned Green Day before and Chris Lord Algy will do that. Sure. A fair bunch, I think, where it's like a line that's there. Another thing that this is really, really, it's almost like baked into electronic music, right? but, but it can actually work quite well in more like pop music and stuff as well or rock music for that matter, the use of like risers and things going into different sections. You can even call them like downers as well when they transitions, when you have that, you got a build up of energy perhaps going into a chorus or going into a break. With a it can also feel like very cinematic to do those things as well. Absolutely. Yeah, you listen to like trailer tracks. It's like they it's do it all the time. All the <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because it freaking works. It does. Right? Yeah, get that blood and pumping. Boom, 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 boom. Yeah, dramatic hero moment. Boom, boom, boom. So th that can be effective as well. And uh, there's something that that we should probably touch on as we're talking about the risers here. And it's a really, really overused effect. Thankfully, you don't hear it that much anymore. But we're all guilty of it. And that's the reverse symbol thing, right? Guilty. I was charged. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'll <laughs> fall on my sword. I've done it way more than I should. Sure. But even there, if you're using that and layering it with something, or if you're creative and you're doing a rhythmic stutter with it, perhaps, or, uh -huh. you know, you're having that go on, you, you can get away with stuff as long as it sounds cool, right? Things become cliche because they work for a while. Impact hits are <sighs> really, really cool. So say that if you, even if you don't have like a riser or anything going into a new section, adding something to really kind of emphasize, here's the downbeat, boom, new section type of thing. <laughs> Get Very out your effective. Tyco drums. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's certainly like that big cinematic stuff, right? Yes. But uh, it, it works really well, I think, with 
rock productions especially as well can to, to signal new sections. Yes, right. I still do it to this day. I try not to be the overused reverse symbol thing, but I do use elements of whipping things up into the chorus, yeah. as they say. Right, because those you can get crazy with, with how you process them and stuff, because there's a lot of times it's not a a natural element to hear that. It's It could be something from, it can be, I mean, it could be just like an orchestral kind of, rise or it could be completely sound design so well there's a whole native instruments instrument called risers i believe yeah and i use that one a fair amount because they've got rise and hit rise and hit that has a whole lot of cool elements to it and it's automatically synced to your tempo which is fantastic you don't have to worry about it yeah heaviosity's gravity does that as well right Yep. has all these different things. With those instruments, I think we have to be a little bit careful because we can start hearing those same things in other places. Well, it's like the, it's, the idea of spectrosonics when RMX was hugely exactly. popular. It's like, hey, wait, I know what that is. That's from RMX, blah, 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 whatever that was. Yeah, so you do have to be careful. Not loop. Yeah. And yeah. maybe that's an element of where you use the riser or the impact hit or something of that nature, the reverse symbol, and you run it through some other effect to get it to be a little bit more unique. What yeah. are some other things to be used in terms of ear candy that you're thinking of? Well, two that come to mind that we've kind of touched on, but it's different instrumentation than that you would expect. Mm -hmm. I mentioned Kiss and the Glockenspiel there, the kind of like double melody. Mm -hmm. That's something that you don't expect. That's something that I think is really cool if you do that. And you can do it subtly and it could be a different piano. It could be whatever, right? Right. But, But that's one. Also along with that Kiss song would be the spoken word thing. Sure. Now, in this case, it's like a, a radio thing. And so th- that's something that can happen anywhere from like trance EDM or anything you hear, like a, a vocal sample or whatever is going on, just a spoken word thing. Yep. Another example of that, I think it just came to my mind is because we both used to play a lot of their stuff was uh, Queensryche's Operation Mind Crime. There's a lot of production candy in that sucker. Yeah. A big, you know, thing. And, and back to Pink Floyd and all this kind of stuff. So those are things that leap out to me. I mean, I we when we talked to Venus Theory, yeah. he mentioned that he uses the sound of rain or something like that in his track. So a lot of these like nature sounds that he would put in there as a bed to kind of sure. have something. Well, to, you know, um, the Beatles did that too with Blackbird, even though it's not a Blackbird that's the nature of the sound of the bird in that song. It is right. called Blackbird, but it is not a Blackbird that's doing the bird chirping in that one. Yeah. So it's so, been done for a long time, but if you do it right, people will love it. Yeah. And this is just a few examples, right? The um, What's the weirdest mentioned- thing that you've ever used as a sound element in a song for production? Oh, that's um, that's a good question. I'd have to. Th- uh, you know what? I'm actually working on a track right now with my co-writer in Sonic Scandal, where you use the sound of a subway station, mm. where there's a subway train coming in. Right. Kind of like so. It, it, that's functioning a little bit to set the scene. Okay. But also as a a riser. So I've done that. I've done finger symbols, that kind of stuff. So, yeah, and God knows for anything else I might have used from sample libraries and reversed and distorted the crap out of. So, <laughs> but I don't know. I'm not sure if anything really leaps out. It's like, oh, that's really weird. What about you? Have you used, knowing you, you probably used some, some esoteric stuff. I've done some esoteric stuff. I did something for a TV show that was sort of, I guess, a takeoff of Stomp and... I sampled myself smashing a filing cabinet with drumsticks for drum sounds. Mm -hmm. So I used a filing cabinet for drum sounds. I've used a Harley kickstart for a kick sound. I've used a door slam for a snare. In layering a snare on a particular track, I actually did along with the snare drum. So you get this weird like 
sound along with the snare in there. Uh, cool. I, yeah. So I, man, what else have I, I've used toilet paper rolls to send sound through a mic at a mic, which is also Yeah, I think different. you talked about that yeah. one before. Yeah. That, that's so, uh, that's a little left field. <laughs> <laughs> I've done a lot of weird things. So yeah. the idea on that though, is to get something that is sounding unique and fits into the arrangement and production of the song that when you tuck it in there, at some point, somebody listens to it, as I've said before, on a different set of speakers than they're normally using. And all of a sudden, they hear something, they go, wait a minute, I've never heard that in there before, <laughs> kind of thing. Yeah, and that that's cool. And that's kind of what you want, because it adds another level to the level of interest, I think. Right. When you're doing that. That extra that's cool. bit of intimacy that you can bring the listener on your little journey. Absolutely. What's the so, one... Overused effect that should just be erased from human existence. That's harsh. <laughs> That's harsh. Uh, I wouldn't go quite that far with it, but there's two that are very overdone, in my opinion. Okay. And we mentioned one of them, and that's the reverse yes, symbol. Mm -hmm. Right. What would be the other the one? The other one, the telephone voice. Yeah, stop doing that, will you please? <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe just not in every track, right? A vocal effect like that can be really, really cool. I mean, I'm reminded of Queen. Was It, it was on and not at the opera. It was one of those songs when they wanted a really messed up vocal effect. And they talked about this. I think it was Roy Thomas Becky that talked about how they were doing it. But they wanted Freddie's voice to really stand out in a really weird way. Mm -hmm. And, of course, these are not the days of plug-in, folks, right? So you, what they did was they sent his vocal through a pair of headphones. They put the headphones in a bucket and mic'd the bucket. Oh, wow. So, See, now that's, yeah. that's, that's left field right there. That is really left field. I don't think it's lazing on a Sunday afternoon, but it's one of those tracks. Right. The whole the seaside type of thing. That's when they did that. Well, didn't that so, be Seaside Rendezvous then? <laughs> that sounds like the track, yes. Okay. So well, yeah. it's one of those anyway, but, but it's really cool. But the telephone voice has it's been a little bit overdone, I think. All right. And with that, yeah. we're going to move on to our Friday finds. Chris, what have you got this week? I am in the process of trying out the demo. I've just downloaded it. It is a piece of software from Sonox, mm. Sony Oxford, called Listen Hub. It's a monitoring system where you can bring in and use reference tracks okay. into your DAW. But it goes a little bit beyond that from what I understand in that it can capture, not capture as in, in record, but with some routing, you can get things from, let's say that you're listening to a reference track from Spotify or Apple Music or something. You can route that via Listen Hub into your DAW. Oh. And you can go and bypass and go back and forth. So you can check your mix that way. Nice. And one thing that I thought was intriguing there, again, I haven't gotten my fingers really dirty with it yet. It's that it can run system wide. Mm. So you could do that as well, and it can load, I believe it can load plugins into it when it's running system-wide. So for me, I'm a recent acquirer of the BSX system with Slate, right. with the room emulations. So I'm eager to see how this is going to work with reference tracks, because right now the VSX doesn't run system-wide. So it would be nice to use that. So anyway, enough ramble, but that's Listen Hub. From Sonox is my yeah. find for this Friday. And what have you got for us? I'm looking at a reverb plug-in by New Gen Audio. You need more reverbs. Everybody needs more reverbs. And this one is kind of like throwing the kitchen sink at reverb in a sense. It is called Paragon ST. It is a convolution reverb that combines itself with the concept of algorithmic reverb and apparently it's doing it fairly flawlessly the idea here is that not only can you put yourself into some particular bit of space you can also modify where it's feeling like it's being miked from you can emulate the distance in a sense 
this is beyond the idea of using pre-delay. And it sounds like a pretty damn cool concept. So my pick this week is the Paragon ST convolution combo algorithmic reverb thing with all kinds of crazy extra benefits to it by new gen audio cool yes while we've got your attention we ask that you go to inside the recording studio.com and sign up for our mailing list doing so we'll get you weekly reminders about the tuesday tips when they come out and we'll make sure you don't miss any future episodes of this awesome podcast Send us an email at goldstar, G-O-L-D-S-T-A-R, at insidetherecordingstudio.com with the word candy, and you'll get something cool back in your inbox. If you have a topic or suggestion for Chris and I to explain in a future episode, contact us at the contact page, and we'll put it into consideration for a future episode. With that, I'll say see you next week. Talk to you later. Thanks for listening, everybody. Thanks for listening, everybody.